CBS 2. Good afternoon. We have breaking news in the Highland Park parade shooting. Let's listen it. And I'll turn it over to Coroner Bannock to start. Good afternoon. On July 4th, 2022, at approximately 10.15 a.m., Highland Park police were on the scene of an active shooter in the area of Central Avenue and 2nd Street, Highland Park, while an Independence Day parade was in progress. The Lake County Coroner's Office was notified and responded to the scene. It is with a heavy heart that I bring to you the names of the victims of that tragedy. 64-year-old Katherine Goldstein of Highland Park, 35-year-old Irina McCarthy of Highland Park, 37-year-old Kevin McCarthy of Highland Park, 63-year-old Jacqueline Sundheim of Highland Park, 88-year-old Stephen Strauss of Highland Park, 78-year-old Nicholas Toledo Zaragoza of Morelos, Mexico. We have also been notified that there is a seventh victim that died at a hospital located outside of Lake County. Um, I will now give the microphone to the mayor of Highland Park, Mayor Nancy Rotering. The Highland Park community, like so many before us, is devastated. It is impossible to imagine the pain of this kind of tragedy until it happens in your backyard. Our focus the last 36 hours has been on the perpetrator of this heinous crime. As we now put the names and faces of those lost yesterday, family, friends, guests, longtime residents of the Highland Park community, our focus shifts to the victims and those left behind. This crisis has devastated entire families and our community in a single moment, and we know it will take time to heal. On behalf of the community and the world that mourns alongside us, I offer loved ones of those who passed our condolences. I thank those who have organized prayer vigils to help support the weight of our shared sorrow. We've listed those on our website, and while we're hurting, we know that we will continue to come together and support each other as we always do in difficult times. We are Highland Park strong. Thank you, Mayor. There were some questions at our last press briefing about prior contacts that law enforcement may have had with Cremo the uh, Third. We've done some research, gathered some reports, and I'm gonna relay some information from two prior instances that occurred here in Highland Park. Uh, the first was in April of 2019. Uh, an individual contacted Highland Park Police Department uh, a week after learning of Mr. Cremo attempting suicide. Uh, this was a delayed report, so Highland Park still responded to the residents a week later, spoke with Cremo, spoke with Cremo's parents, and the matter was being handled by uh, mental health professionals at that time. There was no law enforcement action uh, to be taken it was a mental health issue handled by those professionals. The second occurred in September of 2019. A family member reported that Cremo said he was going to kill everyone and Cremo had a collection of knives. The police responded to his residence. The police removed 16 knives, a dagger and a sword from Cremo's home. At that time, there was no probable cause to arrest. There were arrest. There were no complaints that uh, were signed by any of the victims. The Highland Park Police Department, however, did immediately notify the Illinois State Police of the incident. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, talking about the investigation itself. Uh, the community has been absolutely terrific with providing information to law enforcement investigators throughout this. Um, but we're, we're asking the community to, if they're able to dig a little deeper and, and recall some specific instances from the event, uh, based on video surveillance recovered by our investigators, uh, we're very certain that there was a female witness who saw Cremo drop an object inside of a red blanket behind Ross's at 625 Central Avenue immediately following the shooting. We've not been able to identify this witness yet, but we're asking if you are the witness and you are hearing this, 
please call 800, call FBI. Uh, investigators really would like to speak to you about this. We're also asking that anyone with any firsthand information about CREMO relevant to this investigation also call 800 call FBI. Please keep in mind though, we're asking for firsthand information that could be relevant, that could help investigators. We're not asking for third party information or information heard through the grapevine, only if it's firsthand knowledge that you have. To update the, the victim count, including, including those that have perished, um, there are approximately 45 uh, injured or deceased from this incident. At about 5.30 this evening, the state's attorney's office will be holding a press conference and we anticipate an announcement of charges at that time. With that, we'll take some questions. So going to this September incident, obviously people are gonna look at this and say, well, this could have been an opportunity to stop what we saw here. Uh, your view on that and how are these things supposed to be handled? How do you stop a shooter if someone's calling police saying, hey, we have a problem? So the question is the, the response to the September incident. The police responded there. Police can't make an arrest unless there is probable cause to make an arrest or somebody is willing to sign complaints regarding the arrest. Absent of those things, the police don't have power to detain somebody. Now, if there is an issue where there is the necessity to um, involuntarily commit somebody to the hospital, that's an option, but that wasn't an option at that time. That It didn't fall in that category. But nonetheless, Highland Park Police did notify the Illinois State Police of that. But as, as a law enforcement professional, uh, you see someone who has said, I want to kill someone, uh, then he can purchase several guns, that, like you said, uh, uh, legally. The, How do you view that? The, the threat was directed at family inside of the home. Yeah, but he could even buy guns when he made a clear threat with his family. So in, in order to purchase a gun legally in Illinois, one has to possess a FOID card. That's a process that is, is solely managed for the state police, and I'm not able to speak to that process. Chris, you mentioned how much the community has been helpful in this case with videos, with, with sending information to you guys. So many people I've been talking to are asking, how can this be prevented in the future? Given the amount of social media posts, this is disturbing content that he had posted, would you recommend that community members in this community or others flag police to, to that kind of information? You said you weren't aware of it beforehand. Were you, if you were aware of it, could this have prevented something like this, considering the red flag laws and, and other laws here in the state? So, so the question is essentially social media. If we had known about some of the posts, would we have investigated? Do we encourage the community to report those? And the answer is absolutely. If, if the public sees something that is concerning online with anybody, they should notify the social media network it's posted on. They should notify local law enforcement. And that's when we get involved and we conduct an investigation. Law enforcement's gonna do everything they possibly can to ensure the community is kept safe. But if we don't know about it, it's, it's hard for us to investigate. Under the red flag laws in the state, though, would this potentially have been enough for you to confiscate weapons or take some sort of action? So in, in the case of September, the knives that Cremo possessed, they were confiscated and they were secured for safekeeping. And in the case of the it's, rifles and uh, considering the social media posts and the videos that we have now. So, so at that time, there was no information that he possessed any firearms, any rifles. Um, would that be enough if he's making threats? It's, it's, it's a case by case basis. I don't want to speak broadly to the issue. Um, it depends on the circumstances. There are circumstances where law enforcement does have that authority to uh, uh, obtain a seizure order, uh, but it, it is situational dependent every single time. Chris, Chris there's, 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 a report, there's a report that Cremo visited a synagogue here in town during Passover. Do you know anything about that? Can you speak to that, that's nothing I know about at this time. Chris, Chris, you, mentioned that the, you mentioned that the, the weapons, the um, rifles, were legally purchased in this general Chicago area, but can you specifically say when they were purchased? They were purchased after that September incident. I, I don't have the exact dates. Uh, I believe it was in 2020 and 2021. Chris, earlier this morning we were discussing today. whether we had any additional information on motivation. You said not yet. Is there any new Investigators have been really tirelessly working since Cremo was taken into custody, trying to determine motive. At this point, there there is no definitive motive that he had. Is he talking? He has been talking to investigators. Chris, what was the handgun part of things? When was his boyfriend? I don't have that information right now. Chris, the object that you said was behind glass, what did you know what that was? 
It was the rifle, and it was in a red blanket. Chris, do you have the information that he may have tried it after the shooting, tried to check himself into a hospital, Lutheran General Hospital, as you heard any reports? No, we do not have that information. Just to follow up on the last uh, September incident, you said that involuntarily committing him was not an option. Can you explain that? What, what are the options for officers? Based on that time, based on those circumstances, that, that was not an option. It did not fall in that category. What would it require? It, again, it's, it's case by case specific. Were Irina and Kevin McCarthy, uh, husband and wife, uh, brother and sister, what's, the, what's their relationship? I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't know. Chris, do you have Jennifer, any you handguns that you talked earlier about? Uh, how many were there? Were they legally purchased anything on that? The count, the sheer number? So he had purchased five. Five, five firearms. Five oh. firearms, and that includes rifles and, and handguns as well. So, so the other three legally purchased, and they were handguns? There were a combination of which, I don't have the exact count, at least two rifles, uh, some f uh, pistols, and possibly a shotgun. Those were seized at his father's home uh, pursuant to a search warrant yesterday. What was the size of the knife collection, and did he ever get it back after the incident? I would have to do a little research well, on that. What time period were there five weapons purchased? Approximately a year. Is there any information about that seventh victim who, who passed away in age, perhaps? Not yet, but we are we are working on obtaining some some information. What county is that victim in? Cook. Cook. If the charges are being filed, as you said, probably around five o'clock, does that mean there will be an arraignment likely tomorrow morning? Or? That would be my uh, yes. It, if if charges are filed today, it's very likely he'll appear in bond court tomorrow morning. Do you know what's? Do you have more evidence about or more uh, explanation of what you found in the car? Uh, evidence technicians are collecting a lot of shell casings, uh, but as far as anything of evidentiary value, th that's the extent. In, in the car, was the, you said there was rifles? Or the other rifles in the car, there was a rifle. And anything else? Was it loaded? I would have to check and get back to you. Do you know where he was heading in that car with that second rifle? He, was, he drove around to a number of places. He drove into Wisconsin, then he came back into Illinois. That's when the alert person who recognized the vehicle description uh, from the press briefing called 911 and he was stopped. Chris, are you able to speak to any federal investigation, any possible federal indictments where you would be brought into the federal system? So the FBI, the ATF, our federal partners, the Department of Justice are, are very involved in this case. I, I can't speak for them. Uh, all I can say is they are on the ground here working with us in lockstep. And I could take two more. You know, where in Wisconsin? Going back to the September incident, um, you said police notified state police. What was the follow-up from state police at that point? Um, and was there any monitoring given what had happened of his social media accounts then? And should there have been or not? Do you want to speak, speak to that? My name is Master Sergeant Delilah Garcia. I'm Public Information Officer, Deputy Chief. So basically in September of 2019, ISP did receive information from Highland Park um, Police Department and at that time, uh, the individual uh, named in the report did not have uh, a FOID card or anything uh, to, to revoke or to review. So at that point, we that FOID part of it was our, our stance on that. And there was nothing done to say this person shouldn't be able to get, is there any way, mechanism to say this person shouldn't be able to get a FOID card in the future? Is any action like that taken? Well, that at that time, basically, um, so he didn't have a pending application, so there was nothing to review at that time when we got that notification. We didn't know, and you know, a few months later, something else would happen. And what would state police have to have done or have to have seen in order to try to involuntarily commit someone based on those facts? Or those involuntary commit someone? Right, so the lead came to you to follow up on. After looking at the facts from that, was that an option that you considered? Well, this person might need to be involuntarily committed. committed. Well, there was no FOID application at the time. Correct. I, but the lead came to you, right? This person had knives. Uh, obviously, there was a threat that was posed. Your role was only whether we had a firearm. Or right. And so and the state law, does it allow you to flag okay. someone and say, hey, we're flagging this person, they should, should be a are you allowed to say this person can't get a FOID card? More questions regarding that procedure from the state police will be forthcoming. Um, so we know there's going to be some questions directed to the state police on, on procedure, how FOID card applications work, when a notification comes in from local law enforcement 
that is much better answered by the state police. We, it's very hard to speak to their policies and procedures. Chris, can you tell One us more. Where, where was Donson he traveled to, and how did you track? Him? Was it I pass? I don't want to get into to how we know he was in Wisconsin, but we know he traveled to the Madison area before turning around and coming back to so Illinois. Did his parents, did his parents, Last question. Did his parents ask, uh, was his parents involved when the knives were taken from him? Did they report that he was threatening? And that's the reason why they came to the house to get the knives? A, a family member reported that he was being threatening. So, so in other words, a family member reports the knives being there, but then he's buying guns and nobody said nothing. I'm not quite following your question. The police responded. The police responded in September, okay, to this call. They responded. They took the knives out of the home. They filed the paperwork with the Illinois State Police. At that time, there was no function to make an arrest. But there was the no. Are there watching him buy five or six or seven guns. I, I don't know if the parents were there. I can't thank speak you. to them. All right, thank you. We'll be back at 5.30. All right, guys, just as a reminder, we're going to the west side you of the scene. have been listening to Lake County Major Crimes Task Force spokesperson Chris Cavelli there speaking to the press, giving us our latest update here on the Highland Park 4th of July shooting yesterday that, as we now know, has left seven people dead. A number of new pieces of information coming in late today about where the suspect was in the hours between the shooting and his arrest and some encounters that he had with with authorities in recent years. I think we'd like to start there. Two of them happening uh, and they were in 2019. The first in April, authorities outlining for us that they uh, received a report of a suicide attempt. They responded to the home, but there was nothing further for police to do. The second in September of 2019, where a family member reported that the suspect said he was going to, quote, kill everybody. They found knives in the home and there was a response there, but again, no action police are saying that would have any need to take that suspect into custody. The two other big headlines from this press conference. He made his way all the way up to Madison, Wisconsin between that 1015 shooting and the arrest late yesterday afternoon, early evening. And then we also learned there were some new details about their need to talk with a witness, a woman who they believe saw the suspect drop something into a red blanket. Correct. Uh, that was happening near uh, Ross's, which is a store at 625 Central Avenue up in Highland Park. Okay, we are joined here in the studio by our legal analyst, Irv Miller, who's able to kind of put some perspective behind what we heard there today and where things are going. Still no charges here, Irv, but from where you sit, what's the big news here today? The big news is they are not ready to file charges, so they would have announced it here today, and I think there's a reason why they were not ready. They're not done talking to them. They're hoping to get a motive for this whole thing out of them, and they're willing to take the time, and frankly, they have the time. Uh, legally, they have another 24 hours to basically question him before they uh, have charges. If they don't uh, make a decision in 24 hours, they've got to release them if they decide not to charge them at that time. So it's charge or release 24 hours from now. It does sound like there's a chance we may hear at, uh, I believe it was 530, when we hear again from them at another press conference, that charges could come then. What do you think today looked like for those investigators who are trying to speak with the suspect? Well, they're trying to figure out if, in fact, there may be in the future the basis for a federal charge of domestic terrorism. But you need to know what the motive is before a federal charge of domestic terrorism can apply. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think they're going to continue to question him, hope to break him, frankly. Mm -hmm. He gives up. It's been a long time since he's uh, been arrested. And eventually a, a trained investigator will work uh, their way into his good graces. And hopefully he is, the theory is, they'll start to trust the police officer and starts building his guts, as we say in the trade. Right. And that's what they're waiting for. The motive is the big thing in this particular case. And the big time to circle on our calendar today is about 5.30 is when mm -hmm. we're expecting to hear more information on that. Irv, thanks very much. If you can stay by here with us, we're going to need to rely on you throughout the afternoon. But we want to talk about some of the victims that we learned about today. We do. That was truly the top headline, is mm -hmm. the names of the six, six of the seven that we know perished in this shooting. We'd like to run through them briefly. Uh, Catherine Goldstein of Highland Park. But first, these are photos that we have of the victims. This is Nicholas Toledo, Zaragoza, and his family uh, spoke to one of our reporters, Tim McNicholas, yesterday. They called him loving, creative, and adventurous, a father of eight, a grandfather to many more, and we understand he was visiting from Mexico.
That's right. We also learned the name Jackie Sundheim today. That is one of the names that we learned from that press conference this afternoon. Uh, what do we know about Jackie? Jackie was a member of the North Shore Congregation Israel for decades. She was a cherished member of the staff there in a statement that that congregation sent out last night um, to uh, the faithful. They mentioned that she touched so many people in that community from her teaching at the preschool there uh, to just consoling and uh, being a, a shoulder to lean on um, for the many people that she knew. They, they said she walked us through life's moments of joy and sorrow with tireless dedication. We also learned the names of Kevin and Irina McCarthy. They made news yesterday uh, because at, on Channel 2, actually, we had the picture of their little boy who we weren't sure where his parents were at. And the grim story has unfolded in the last 24 hours that both his parents, as you see, Kevin and Irina McCarthy, died yesterday from that shooting up in Highland Park, confirmed by authorities just in the last few minutes. Such heartbreak, both of them in their 30s. And we know so many people did rally um, to make sure that their son was safe. So people uh, are expressing a lot of sorrow for them and also trying to help out the family in a GoFundMe that we found earlier today. There were two other names, Catherine Goldstein from Highland Park and Steve Strauss was the other name. And then there's a seventh victim uh, that they have not yet identified the name. There was a question as to whether or not that might be a minor. So far, there have been no children uh, who died from this, uh, possibly. Uh, that is a story we're going to be following later on this afternoon. All we know is that person was not being treated in Lake County. They say that happened in Cook County. It did seem like they were trying to gather some more information. So hopefully at 530, we could learn more um, about that seventh person. Yes. So a lot of moving parts here. We're going to have a complete wrap up for you coming up on our news at four o'clock. We have a team of reporters fanned out up in Highland Park as we continue to move through this story. The number of moving parts, as we learned earlier today, that the uh, gun was bought legally. Mm -hmm. um, the multiple guns that were found, one in his vehicle, uh, at least uh, one a total of, I believe they said in that press conference, five firearms total, some in his home, some in his vehicle. Let's bring Irv Miller back into the conversation. Irv, you know, when we hear about this incident in September of 2019 where he said he was going to kill everyone. Um, I feel like in recent stories, when we hear about issues up in Buffalo, New York and Uvalde, Texas, we get the personality profile of these individuals. And this is the kind of language we often hear about these people who often snap in this way. Um, are there any lapses from the governmental system in some way when somebody says something like that, the police are notified of it and then later is able to legally purchase a weapon? The problem is a lot of these cases fall through the legal cracks, mm. as simple as that. You talk about involuntary commitment to a mental health institute. Well, there has to be a finding that he's either a danger to himself or to others made by a professional. Not a police officer who comes to the door and gets a complaint from a relative saying, hey, he just said he's going to kill everybody. I don't think he's serious. I'm not going to sign a complaint. Is that going to go anywhere? Probably not, either then or now. It all depends on the underlying circumstances of what a reasonable police officer may believe that's going to take action. In this case, Highland Park notified the Illinois State Police about mm -hmm. the one incident. Um, they were more concerned with whether or not there was an application for an FOID card or an FOID card and not the underlying issue of why they were notified. So uh, that's a problem area. It did seem that Illinois State Police uh, were going to be looking into that. Again, everything is so fresh and new as we were getting this information in. Irv, I wanted to ask you, the suspect, or the person of interest suspect is in custody right now. We're, we're connecting all these dots. And yet there is still this push, uh, investigators asking for people to continue to send in video, this search for the woman who mm -hmm. they say that they this woman would have witnessed the suspect dropping something in this red blanket outside or behind, rather, that Ross Cosmetics. This effort to still gather information seems just as strong as it was uh, short in the hours after the shooting. That doesn't surprise you. Doesn't surprise me and it's not going to end at the moment that charges are filed right. because that at that particular time the state's attorney's office the Lake County State's Attorney's Office totally takes over the case. Mm -hmm. They have their own investigators in addition to using the Highland Park Police Department and they're going to try to solidify their case. They want to go to trial with the strongest case possible and it doesn't make any difference whether the witness comes forward yesterday or in the future as long as it's a credible witness. All right, Irv, thanks very much. We very much appreciate your insight. We're going to continue to follow this developing story throughout the afternoon. Just a couple minutes from now, our news at 4 o'clock will have a full recap. We will see you then. This has been breaking news from CBS2.